Joan Agajanian Quinn is the former West Coast editor of Andy Warhol's Interview Magazine and society editor of the Herald Examiner. Her cover stories are seen in Venice and Detour magazines, and she is a contributing editor to Angelus Magazine. For the next half hour, Joan will bring you inside news and views on society, art, film, and the exhilarating worlds of these multifaceted people. Here is Joan Quinn. Welcome to Joan Quinn, etc. We'll be talking to Stephanie Beecham and Tony Fitzjohn. Each one started life in Britain, and each has traveled away and become famous elsewhere. Stephanie Beecham has worked in television, film, and on the stage. She was classically trained at the Academy of Dramatic Arts in London and studied mime in Paris. She's an accomplished actress who has worked with Jeremy Irons, Roddy McDowell, the late Ava Gardner, and the real phantom of the opera, Michael Crawford. Stephanie was nominated for the British Academy Award for a film, Nightcomers, co-starring Marlon Brando. But here in the US, she's best known for her work as Sable Colby on ABC's TV series, Dynasty and the Colbys. Tell us about that character. The bitch. The bitch. <laughs> <laughs> What's to be said? <laughs> she, was, she was a rather uh, uh, misguided woman with a very good series of hairdos and a lot of good jewelry. What can I say? <laughs> Do you have trouble shaking that? No, uh, not at all. Not no? at all. It was much harder getting dressed for her in the mornings. Um, no, I, she's, she's, she's in her closet now. She's, uh, uh, she's resting. She's resting with all her clothes. Do people kind of look at you in public and kind of give you this funny little look, like is she really mean or not mean? What, step back three paces and allow <laughs> me through the door? Yes, sometimes. <laughs> Do they? Yeah. You did another series, uh, Sister Kate. What kind of character was that? Well, she was, she was a nun um, <laughs> uh, uh, with a value system about as opposite as Sables as you could possibly get, which is why I did it, just to simply put the balance in. As soon as anything goes too far in one direction, I like to balance it out uh, in the other direction. And you can do it so easily. Well, yes, I can scrub my face free of makeup and put a habit on. <laughs> Whether it's wise to or not, I don't know. What about the mentality part of it? Ah, that's, that's, that's where, that's the most fun in acting for me. It's the imagination, it's the crossword puzzle, it's the uh, jigsaw puzzle of a character. I love that. I mean, I can daydream a lot. You can put it all together. Oh, I love it, yes. Your career spanned 20 years in England before you came here and had very successful in England and came here and very successful in America and I'm sure you're successful in both countries at I the same it. time. Yes, I it. <laughs> at the same time. But how did it all start? Um, how did you get into this acting business? Um, I was visiting a boyfriend in Liverpool and Liverpool was a very lively place. It was just where the Beatles had been discovered. Um, there, there was a, a series of poets called the Liverpool Eight Poets, and it was a very, very lively place. And there was a theatre being set up by some very young people who wanted to bring Shakespeare to the masses. And I uh, went up and I saw what was going on. I didn't know what theatre was. My experience of the theatre was honestly the pantomime at Christmas. Uh, ballet was what I loved. Did you dance? Oh yes, that's what I wanted to be. Oh. But I was turned down by the Royal Ballet School at the age of 11. Because? Was, because I didn't have wonderful feet. Your arches weren't like <laughs> that's this. Right, because I, uh, I'm lucky, I'm lucky. I mean a dancer's <laughs> life is very hard uh, and then it's all over. That's right. So you, you can go on forever. Hopefully, yes. <laughs> so, was Shakespeare difficult for you? You get oh, to Liverpool well, and you're thinking about sorry, Shakespeare? Well, I it was just I suddenly thought, oh, this is theatre. This is theatre. It's wonderful. I want to join. And I knew a speech from Romeo and Juliet. And I just did it for them. And they laughed. I don't know if you're meant to laugh when you're playing, playing <laughs> Juliet. Uh, anyway, uh, they laughed. They let me in because they knew they could pay me very little money. And I fell in love with the theatre. And I went to the Royal Academy after that to get what was called technique. So you really started in Liverpool just with a Shakespearean company? Yes, yes. You'd never studied in no. high school? How old no. were you at that point? Seventeen. Oh. And, but I thought I was going to teach mime to deaf children. 
That's what I thought my career was going Why to be. Why did that come into play? Oh, um, I'm very deaf. I have no hearing at all in my right side, and my left side is okay, but it's not perfect. For how long? Oh, since birth. I don't think I've ever... I have no idea. Did you I've never know? Heard in, I've never heard in stereo. It's not a bore. But did you ever think uh, that you ha had a loss of hearing? I was told. Because if you hear out of one ear and you don't know stereo, like you're saying, no, I was told uh, at the age of four, um, I had my adenoids out. Mm. They thought that might help. Mm -hmm. Remember, the dinosaurs were roaring. I mean, it wasn't a very <laughs> sophisticated uh, uh, investigation that was done into hearing then. Anyway, nothing was to be done. Uh, and I just felt that the, the sadness for deaf people was that they didn't learn rhythm. They didn't learn music. Now they do, of course. There is dance. And they feel vibrations. Yes, and but that's, that, that is the whole point. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to teach <coughs> dance and mime. Um, I wanted deaf people to have a smoothness of movement and elegance. I think that there's a... Because often the <coughs> speech patterns are clumsy, inevitably. I mean, anybody who can actually speak who is deaf is brilliant. Um, uh, I wanted them to have that beauty of moving and feeling music, which is what you can do through, through a bouncing wooden floor mm -hmm. and drums. And I went to Paris to study mine, but I found it a very dry experience. Were you good at it? Oh, I was terribly good at it. <laughs> because I was disciplined, I was, I was disciplined from <coughs> ballet from the age of four. And once you've been used to being reprimanded all the time, five days a week, uh, uh, you're used to that discipline. It's taken me a long time to unwind from that discipline, meaning that it, I, was, I was 32 before I managed to sort of sit comfortably in a chair. I was always upright. Uh, but when you talk about the mime and being disciplined, though, illusion comes into it, doesn't it? Well, uh, that, that, uh, we've already said that. I mean, isn't it fun to have a, a, a vivid imagination? I don't know where that comes from. Um, Probably uh, children's stories when you're very young. So you, so the mime brings those things out. Yes, but I didn't realize how stiff it was going to be. Mm -hmm. uh, we used to have to do obeisance to the coquillage. Um, sounds dirty, doesn't it? Uh, <laughs> the, 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 the whole room was blue. And in mm. this little alcove was a shell. And the shell is the representation of the open and the closed, because this is the position of the mime hand. And we had to do obeisance to uh, pay our respects to this shell, which was the symbol of mime. Oh, what a yawn. I mean, please. <laughs> So, well, it didn't keep you there very long, didn't keep did it? Me there. I thought, no, I think there's more to, uh, there's more to life than um, uh, uh, this little routine. Than the open hand. That's right, the open hand. And I think that speech is uh, fun. I think theatre is far more fun. There's only forms of theatre. Um, the person I, I, was, I studied with, Etienne de Creux, if you mentioned his only really famous pupil, who was Marcel Marceau, he said, il est mort, il n'existe plus, he's dead, he doesn't exist anymore, because the poor bloke had uh, sold out and done a couple of Kodak advertisements. That was just too commercial? It was too commercial. He used props. He used <coughs> props. Oh, you never oh, do hell. that. You know, die. So, um, did you speak French before you went over there? Yes, from the age of four. Oh, you did? I went so to you a were French-speaking convent. Um, uh, so Sister Kate came easily. Oh, you Sister knew. Kate. I knew who Sister Kate was. Sister Kate was Sister Cyril. Oh, you already had a I sister. Knew I knew. I had my sister, who has actually <coughs> been told, uh, I've been told that she is one of my spiritual guides. Oh, great. Yeah. It's just what a Pisces needs, is a spiritual guide. Who's a nun who's going to wrap you over the, the right. knuckles with a ruler, yes, yeah, sure. One more person in That's our lives to make <laughs> a decision. Possibly, yes. <laughs> So after uh, deciding mime was not what you wanted? I visited this boyfriend in oh, Liverpool. Oh, and then you went to? And, and joined the theatre. I see. Extraordinarily lucky. Extraordinarily lucky. Are you working um, with the deaf in America or in England? As much you, as I possibly can. How do you do that? By that fortunate thing that you can do when you get a little bit known, that you're, you add your name uh, and you work for charity. I do enjoy that work. It's, it's a so wonderful way to say thank you 
for, for I mean, you get a lot of praise, and it's heavenly to say, hmm, I can use this, because look, I can turn around and I can help with a fundraiser. Yes. And isn't it lovely that, that maybe me being there and saying a speech is going to help sell some tickets, and thus charity will make some money. It's, uh, it's a way of not taking the praise into yourself. Mm -hmm. oh, stop miming, Stephanie. <laughs> uh, no, keep your hands down, girl. Um, uh, not taking the praise to yourself, but being able to put it back uh, where it is needed. But I do find that smashing. That's what is so good when you have a name recognition and you can go in and help those organizations. I ran into you on Rodeo Drive at the Cancer Concern um, organization where they close off the whole street and there you were bouncing down the street in your tennis shoes and your little white skirt and that's only because I've been on the vodka counter. No, I don't drink. <laughs> I was going to ask you what you did to help that I was, day. I was serving drinks. I mean, that's what you, you do, what you do. You do what you It's fun, <clears throat> isn't it? But it was great. You had a big following. You had a, uh, groupies around you. And they all thought you were terrific. They, I was wondering if they would step back and be put off by you. But they were walking after you, maybe to see uh, <laughs> what you really are like. I think that's always a fascination, isn't it? And there's a delicate balance that you have to strike between... I find fans a difficult situation. That sounds so grand. No, but let's it's talk not about a, it's it. It's actually... With... Well, the extreme, of course, was Rebecca Schaefer. Yes, that's... That kind of thing. Even on... Uh, at the Doolittle Theater, when you... Uh, uh, start in the vortex. You had people in the audience clamoring when you walked on stage, I mean applauding and standing up. It was this type of um, being known, being either idolized or having a fascination with you. And I had never seen you in person or doing anything. And I was really a, a kind of interested in how this development between fan or public and Stephanie came about. They loved you. They cheered for you. I mean, it, it was something that you could feel immediately in the audience. Oh, that's terribly nice that you felt that. It's a shame being deaf. I ne never hear any of those <laughs> things. Um, do you hear any of the audience? Oh, yes, because you, you sense do. them. You sense them. It's, it's an intuitive thing. Uh, you can feel the warmth of an audience immediately. I know it's always said that act actors love to get on stage and the, 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 you know, the, the thrill of the live audience, but in a way it's true. It's very energizing. It's do you very do positive. anything that um, gets your public to be uh, Stephanie Beecham groupie or public or, or fan? Is there anything that you think consciously that oh, you do? Oh, goodness me, no. I really not... Um, I love it when people say, I did enjoy that thing, or I did enjoy that thing. I'm not very keen when they're thinking that they're seeing me. Mm. Oh, I see. Your character. I'm mummy, and I stay at home, and I do this, and I do that. I love it when somebody's admired. I mean, people admiring your work, hell. I mean, that's better mm -hmm. than being told off, isn't it? During a performance, say the Vortex, um, is something happen during a performance? Did something funny happen? Did funny in the vortex? Nothing <laughs> funny happened in the vortex. Was that was the most <laughs> ghastly thing to do. Can you imagine having a nervous breakdown eight times a week? How did you do it? Um, I hate to believe that there is a well of sadness that large inside me and in probably inside oh, of most of us. It was interesting because we, our opening night was the night of the, the beginning of the Gulf War. That's what I was going to ask you. Do you mark one of your performance with something that's happened? You know, so it, no, it's, it's quite extraordinary <laughs> because already we're talking about that. Yes. My eyes are going. I mean, I could start weeping immediately. The idea that there were people being killed gave me the ability to have a nervous breakdown every single flaming night. The idea that we were at war, uh, that was a terrible time for the world. And you re but you do mark that performance with something that was going on. Because I, I remembered that it was the Gulf War yes. and that I saw 
Stephanie that night, and it was hard for people to come out. That's right. It was a bit like being with VSO. It was, it was um, uh, uh, one felt like Bob Hope, mm -hmm. because it was yeah. entertaining. <laughs> exactly. And, yes. You do work, work, work. Do you have a family? Oh, very much so. I've got uh, uh, two daughters, Phoebe and Chloe. Uh, uh, Chloe's 14, Phoebe's is 16. And I've been a single parent mum and done it all myself, Joan. And I, I think the greatest, I mean, if I say, if anybody said, what's your greatest role? I, I wouldn't have one. What's my greatest achievement? The fact that my kids are doing really, really well. We have good communication. I adore them. They seem to adore me. That's my achievement. And I've done them by myself. They live in uh, London. They go to school well, in? No, we, well, I would get cross about that because they, <laughs> they live with me. Wherever you but are. But they go to school oh, in England. I see. I see. Um, so does that make you bicontinental? <laughs> definitely. If not does a few it, make more the, it makes the children bicontinental too? Uh, the girls. No, I think they feel very English. I think they, they, oh. they observe in other countries. They feel very English. So we do have a rather English base to, to our lives. Do you think that's traditional to have your children go to school? Oh, well, this is, I, I can remember being terribly upset when I realized that anybody in California who sent their children to boarding school, it was because they didn't like them. Yes, that's what we're whereas, <laughs> whereas in England, you will go without uh, new sweaters, new jumpers as we call them, uh, definitely without a new car uh, to afford the school fees. It's some ridiculous thing that we've always done. But, but, um, uh, but, but it's because you adore your children that you send great. them away with their little trunks. That's great. Um, um, we have about 20 seconds oh left. Oh, goodness. Can you tell Life. me what you like Life. about, you know, we've talked about everything, what you like about Los Angeles? Just about everything. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, because I adore the positivity. I adore the greed. Greed's such an interesting Ooh. thing if it's turned positive. <laughs> so that, I think we should stop with that. I think that's very interesting. And I want to thank Stephanie Beecham for being with us. And thank you. We'll be right back after the break. Stay tuned to Joan Quinn, etc. Hi, Stephanie Beecham had to dash, as she said and left our guest, Tony Fitzjohn, here by himself. But Tony is the executive director of Tony Fitzjohn George Adamson African Wildlife Preservation Trust. It's a mouthful, but he'll tell us all about it. Tony was born in Britain in 1945. As a child living outside of London, he spent time reading Tarzan stories. This must have started the fires of escape burning because while attending high school, he was sent on an outward bound program. What is that, Tony? We don't know about outward bound programs. Um, I think you have them here. They're, they're outdoor pursuit course where you get to run around the countryside and go canoeing and climb mountains and just have a lot of fun outside and um, and do different adventurous things. You know. It wasn't for naughty boys. Not, no, <laughs> that one came later. <laughs> it must have done something to you because you've been living in Africa for 20 years. I, I always loved the idea of just taking off and going in the countryside and, and being at peace with nature. And then on top of that, at this course I went to, um, one of the instructors there had been a warden in East Africa in the Serengeti for 15 years and talked to me about his experiences and, and <laughs> the vast plains of Africa and the animals and I thought, right, that's it, I'm going. Is that right? And he said, I'd love to help you, but you're 20 years too late. And having never listened to any advice in my life, I just took off and, you know, <laughs> went to see what would happen. Yeah. Well, you're currently working on the Mokomazi project, which deals with environmental conservation and reintroduction of endangered species to the, to the wild. What does that mean? Will you explain the project to us? Um, well, after spending two or three years in Africa moving around, doing all sorts of things and, and teaching for these schools myself, I met up with George Adamson. Um, and he was returning animals to the wild, uh, lions at the time. And throughout the years I spent with him, it was George who was my mentor who stimulated me to um, 
to do this work. And we spent 10 years together putting lions back, and then our MO in camp for seven years, returning leopards to the wild, which in the area we were in at the time in northern Kenya um, was very, very short of leopards. They'd all been poached out by the 1940s. And um, with uh, me having to leave Cora and with George's death, we moved on to Tanzania. Let's just stop for a minute. Sorry. George was in Cora. Just in a, northern Kenya, yes. In northern Kenya. Let's just show a picture of him and tell us a little bit when you were talking about putting the lions back. Let's stop and talk about that. Tell us a little oh, bit. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, uh, George Adamson, um, for many years, was a game warden in East Africa. Um, in the mid-1960s, his wife uh, wrote a book called Born Free, which <coughs> publicized the work they'd done uh, putting one lioness Elsa back in, into the wild. Um, I must admit I'd never read the book, but I would had heard about George in my travels in East Africa. Um, and by strange coincidence, coincidences, got to meet him. And from the day I arrived, it was, it was everything I'd been looking for in my life. It was, it was adventure, it was contact, it was... He'd been there for so long. How did he respond to another human being coming into his area? Um, he was very good about it. I mean, George and I suited each other immensely at the time we met. He was desperate for a younger uh, man to, with the energy and, and the enthusiasm to give him a hand. Um, and I was desperately in need of some direction and, and a place where I could fulfill the dream that I had of, of wanting to be in Africa. So. Um Earlier you spoke about the poachers. Tell us a little bit about poachers and what happened to the leopard. Uh, was it the leopard colony that you were? Well, yes, the leopard, pro the leopard program basically went, went very well. Poachers came in um, <coughs> in a very heavy, in the early, uh, the turn of the century to uh, trap out leopards for coats in America and Europe mainly. Um, and just tell us what a poacher is, just in case uh, someone watching doesn't know. A poacher is, is a, a local person. Um, uh, within, local in Africa. With local in Africa, within ah, the context, uh, context of being around the reserve, um, that realizes that by killing the wild animals, um, he can make a very big profit. These he then sells to a middleman, who then exports to supplier demand. Um, from the outside world. For every th all kinds of animals? Uh, mainly, it was mainly the cats to start with. Um, and then came the big run on the, on the rhino uh, for their horn. And in the past 10, 12 years, um, the very, very heavy poaching on the elephant for ivory. How do you keep them from doing that? Um, two ways. One, by effective uh, operations <clears throat> in the field. Um, and secondly, by appealing to the outside world um, not to buy these products. Just to let us all know what it is that they're... Th that th what they're actually buying. What they're buying is a dead elephant whose meat isn't used, that's been walking around for 50, 60 years, um, and been shot for his teeth, or, or poisoned for his teeth. And the only way you can get these animals back off... The, the, I should say, they do so much of it that the animals become endangered. Is that the idea? Some animal species get right down uh, to endangered levels. In some areas, um, the animals have disappeared completely. You threw um, me. It was so, the idea of, of what you were talking about just got to me. And I... Uh, I always remember George, when I first joined him, always saying the animals were going to go on forever. It was not a problem. And 50 years later, um, we have to get into, into very heavy management practice and organization to, to save these animals. So that's what, what Mokomazi is, and basically? Very much so. Mokomazi is a microcosm <coughs> of, of the problems all around Africa and other uh, wildlife areas and environments in the world of, of um, people and boundaries and borders. And How are you there? Places. How do you get to stay there and do this work? Um, when I was uh, leaving Kenya, I approached the Tanzanian government and asked them if there was an area I could work in. By this time, um, I'd realized the state of a very endangered African hunting dog um, and wanted to run a hands-on program um, to rehabilitate a pack of dogs mm. back into the wild from young um, and give them the necessary veterinary support that they need and everything else. And um, the Tanzanians just said, well, look around, find a place you'd like to go. And with them, we found Mukamazi, and we're working together to get the infrastructure in place. They had to 
believe that you weren't part of this poaching situation. Um, <coughs> my reputation probably preceded me beforehand in, um, as to what I've been doing in Kenya and what everybody thought of it. Who, uh, how do you fund these things, these operations, just basically, quickly? Um, we have an organization, uh, Wildlife Trust, based here in LA. Um, and, uh, and through private parties and friends and, and um, help from very many people around LA, we managed to keep going. We have on the screen right now some of the uh, wildlife you were talking about. You want to just tell well, us what we're seeing? Elephants are what, these are the African hunting dog. Um, they've been very badly hit <coughs> by being shot as vermin and poaching over the years and poisoning. These are some of the lions George Adamson um, and myself put back in the wild. This is a shot showing the uh, speed and the running capability of the cheetah. Do they really That's love being back in the wild? They love it. <laughs> Everything loves to be free. You know? <laughs> and little young ones. Beautiful. And there's a background shot there of where we're working at the moment. That's, that's great. But we see, yesterday when I spoke to you, you said you were up in the air all day. What were you doing? Um, I've been a fairly barnstorming bush pilot with a little old plane in Africa for a long time. Um, and I'm doing an instrument rating now to, to tidy up my flying and to make sure if I do get into trouble, hopefully I can get out of it. Oh, time. I see. So you were actually working your so way. I was flying around out of van <laughs> nice, trying to avoid everybody else. Anyway. And very quickly, you said that this morning you would be in the Simula tank, in the, the simulator, yeah. for the same reason? Yeah, very much. We have to go. We loved seeing your clips and talking to you. And uh, I think that the work you're doing is wonderful. Will you tell us very quickly what you like about Los Angeles? I feel very much at home here. Everyone's very friendly um, and protects me from the madness of the regular world. Um, and everyone's very generous and, uh, and helps me keep Mukamazi going. And I'd like to thank you and everybody else. You're thank welcome. You. Also, we could never figure out how um, Tony Fitz, Fitz John could leave the creature comforts of the world and go and live with the creatures in the wild. But looking at him and seeing him, we see that he really loves his animals. Thank you for being with uh, Joan Quinn, etc., and we'll see you next time. Bye, Tony.